I want to express my deep appreciation for this opportunity to worship with you today and especially for the opportunity to, to bring you the message. The title of my message this morning is Rescue or Flush. When I served the United Methodist Church in, in Dallas Center, Iowa, I um, had a small rest, restroom right off of my office. And one day I went in there to discover a box elder bug treading water in the stool. Now, when you find a box elder bug treading water in the stool, you have a decision to make. And that decision is rescue or flush. Well, I decided to rescue that box elder bug, and so I took a piece of paper and I folded it over and placed it in the water so he could get a hold of it. I lifted him out and placed him on the floor, and he just lay there, seemingly too tired to move a muscle. Well, I left him there and went back to work, but a little while later I went back in to check on him and discovered that he was halfway up the outside of the stool again. And I thought, he is a slow learner. But I just left him there and I, I uh, went back to work, but a little while later I thought about my friend the box elder bug again, and I went in there to discover that he had gone back down from the, the stool and he was walking across the floor. He had learned after all. That leads me to ask the question, how often might any of us find ourselves treading water and in the stool? And uh, that can happen for a variety of reasons, but when it does happen, I need to ask the question, does God rescue or flush? Well, I believe that that is a profound question, not only because it relates to our eternal destiny, but perhaps even more importantly, because it relates to what we think about God. What is God like? Is God one who flushes? Or is God one who rescues? Well, I believe that there is no end to how many times God will fish us out. God's patience never runs out. God never gives up on people. It seems to me that, that God sent Jesus to be our Savior, and if, if God sent Jesus to be our Savior, and if it was in His intention to flush, why would He have sent Jesus in the first place? Back at the time of Jesus, there were some people, namely the scribes and the Pharisees, who believed that there were certain other people who were a flushable kind of people. They were the outcasts of society. And that is reflected various uh, places in Scripture. But one of them is in Luke chapter 15, which is my Scripture text today. And the first two verses read, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. <laughs> In other words, they were saying to Jesus, these are outcasts. These are not rescuable kind of people. It really is quite proper to flush them. So Jesus told them a parable as we continue in uh, 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 chapter 15 of Luke. He said, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. In this parable, the sheep represents uh, people and the shepherd represents God. And there was ninety-nine percent of them that were saved. And uh, only one was lost. And we could ask, isn't 99% good enough? Now, I don't know what it is like in your congregation, but in all of my 27 years of serving United Methodist Churches in Iowa, if on only one Sunday, 99% of the people had shown up for worship, I would have thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, that is phenomenal success, isn't it? 99%. Who could ask for more than that? So we could ask. Is it 99% good enough? Wouldn't it be okay to flush just one of them? It seems clear that the answer is no. In this particular situation, it's obvious that, that the shepherd was not content with 99% being saved, but kept looking until he found the last lost sheep. It is of enormous significance in that passage that it does not say that he looked until he gave up and went home without it. It says he looked until he found that one last lost sheep. And Jesus says that's what God is like. He's looking until all are found. In the case of the lost sheep, it apparently hadn't done anything wrong, but had just wandered off. And so we can ask, 
Does God flush those who are lost and treading water because they have just wandered off? It seems clear that the answer is no. Then there are those who may find themselves lost and treading water due to no fault of their own. Jesus tells another parable as we continue with Luke 15, uh, 8 through 10. He says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search diligently until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It obviously wasn't the coin's fault that it was lost. So, does God flush those who are lost and treading water due to no fault of their own? It seems clear that the answer is no. Then there are those who intentionally go astray. With those who just wander off or who are lost due to no fault of their own, most people probably would think that it would be wonderful if God could, could rescue them, if God could save them, because they really hadn't done anything wrong. So it would just be the proper thing to do to rescue them. But with those who intentionally go astray, that would seem to be a different situation. I grew up being taught that if you intentionally reject God, you can expect to be punished. Well, Jesus seems to anticipate that line of thinking, and so he tells another parable. He tells a parable about a father who had two sons. And uh, the younger of the two boys asked his father for his share of the inheritance. Now think about that. Think of the audacity of that boy. You'd think he at least would have had the courtesy to wait till his father had died until he asked for inheritance or expected inheritance, right? But he didn't. His father was alive and well, and he asked for inheritance. Equally surprising, his father gave it to him. How many of us would have done the same thing? But of course, that's really not uh, the, the point of the parable. The point of the parable relates to the relationship between the father and his two sons. And the primary focus is the relationship between the father and the younger of the two. So the younger of the sons asked his father for his share of the inheritance. He took it into a far country, he squandered it in sinful and foolish living. And he uh, was without any resources, and a famine arose, and he found himself out in the field feeding the pigs. And that's about as low as you can go for a Jewish boy, right? Uh, you see, they considered pigs to be unclean, and, and therefore they wouldn't eat pork. So there he was, out in the field feeding the pigs, and it says that he was so hungry that he felt like eating the pigs' feed. Well, then it says he came to himself, and he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. So he said, what I will do, I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And even before he had a chance to say, Treat me as one of your hired hands, the father said quickly, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So, does God flush those who are lost and treading water because they have intentionally gone astray? It seems clear from this parable that the answer is no. On the contrary, the father who represents God kept looking for and yearning for and longing for his lost son to come home. And when he did come home, he enthusiastically welcomed him in spite of the bad things that he had done. Okay. Some might say, that's all well and good, all those wonderful stories in the Bible about how loving God is and how much God wants to save everyone and so on. But how about those who are still rejecting God at the time that they die and as a result may find themselves treading water in hell, the greatest toilet of all? Surely they are flushable. Surely they won't be rescued. Well, again, when I was uh, growing up, I was uh, taught that once you get into hell, you're stuck. There's no way to get out of hell once you get in. You're there for the duration, no matter what, I was told. 
Well, in more recent years, however, I have come to the conclusion that there is hope, even for people who may find themselves experiencing hell in the next life. After all, the Bible says that God is with people in hell. That's what it says in Psalms 139, verses 7 through 8, that reads, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or the abode of the dead, or hell, you are there. Then Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 38 through 39 reads, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can separate us from God's presence, not even hell, and nothing can separate us from God's love, not even death. God is even with people in hell, and I believe is there for the purpose of rescuing them. That's what we affirm each time we recite the words of the Apostles' Creed. The traditional version you may know reads that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and so on. And why did Jesus descend into hell? Well, it's been believed ever since the time of the early church that Jesus descended into hell to proclaim the good news to the people there, to convert them, to transform them so that they could experience heaven. And there's a good reason why people have believed that ever since the time of the early church. And that is because that's what it says in the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, and then that concludes with chapter 4, verse 6, it reads, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went all, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. For this is the reason that the, that the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. I think that's a wonderful and astonishing, a powerful passage of scripture. It talks about Christ going to hell to preach the good news to the people there. And it specifically mentions the people who died during the time of the flood, according to the story of the flood in, in the book of Genesis. And um, it, he makes, in, in that uh, passage, makes reference to, to Noah. And we know that that at the time of the flood, God determined that the people were wretchedly wicked. And therefore, God decided that this humankind business was just a bad experiment and, experiment and was going to wipe everybody out with the flood. But then on second thought, God uh, seemed to reconsider and uh, conclude that there was this one family, Noah and his family, eight people in all, where there did seem to be some hope. And so God instructed them to build an ark. And uh, therefore, they built an ark and were able to survive the flood. Now, I suppose you could say that that's an example of where God really did flush, right? I mean, that's a flush to meet all flushes. Send the flood to wipe out all of humankind except for eight people. And you know, you would be left with that conclusion if you read only the Old Testament. But when you read the New Testament, you get the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is in the passage that I read from 1 Peter. It... Uh, it says that Christ went to hell to preach the good news to the people in hell. And it specifically mentions the people who died during the time of Noah. In other words, he went to preach to the most evil people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. It's important to acknowledge that Jesus did not go to hell to preach to the people who were basically pretty good people who just weren't quite good enough to get into heaven. No. It says he went to preach to the people who died during the time of Noah. He went to preach to the people who were the most wicked, awful, evil people that have ever lived on the face of the earth to rescue them, to transform them, to convert them so that they could experience heaven. So it seems to me that if there is hope for the most evil people that have ever lived on the face of the earth, there surely must be hope for everyone else. So God is not a God who flushes, but is one who always rescues. Does that mean that everyone will eventually be saved? Yes. I believe so. 
Will even those who uh, initially go to hell eventually be saved? Yes, I believe so. In fact, the Bible seems to be very clear on that specific point. Regarding the prospect of salvation for everyone, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6 reads that God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. So God wants to save everybody, and I believe God can pull it off.